Have you always looked at malware that encrypts files surprised, saying to yourself, oh man, how the hell did they even craft this? Well, when I was younger, I truly did wonder. At the end of the day, ransomware samples were exactly what brought me into the malware researching part of computers. Today we're going to analyze exactly how ransomware attacks work, literally step by step, and then create our own, exclusively for entertainment and education usage. To know what we're up against, let's look into a very well-known attack, WannaCry. The malware itself was pretty simple. It went through the file system and encrypted each file one by one, with a combination of the AES and RSA algorithms, replacing it with a useless file since you have no private key available to you. The question you might have is, how do we actually find which files are user files and not system files, since they're on the same drive? Well, there are multiple techniques to do that. I'm going to list the two most simple though. Extension-based filtering and parent folder-based filtering. Extension-based filtering is where the file extension is run through an array of common file system extensions. However, it does have a downside, which is that the user can just archive their files in those extensions that the malware backlists. It also requires a bunch of checks that might bottleneck the encryption process. Parent folder-based filtering, on the other hand, is where the files inside system directories, like the Windows directory for example, are completely ignored. This solves issues like accidental system file encryption. The user can still put files in those directories and they will not get picked up though. The reality is, neither is perfect. They both work exceptionally since the user doesn't expect the attack and doesn't have enough time to put their personal files inside any special folder or change their file extensions. It really is that surprising, there is no time left to respond. Before we initiate this section, I have to say, do not use what I teach you maliciously. As we already know and said countless times on this channel, malware is no joke and you should not use it to your advantage. With the disclaimers out of the way, let's get started. The stack will be, guess what, C++ and the Win API. We'll be using Windows Cryptography API for the encryption process and the basic HTTP API for server-sided tasks. You'll see why that is necessary in a bit. For the encryption, we will be using AES-128. It is simple, already included in Windows Cryptography API, and most importantly of all, only requires a secret key that can be used for in-place decryption afterwards. Note that not all people creating ransomware account for this, which has in history resulted in completely unrecoverable files. The code for encrypting is not that simple. It took me much, much effort, reading documentation and most of all, trial and error. I'll try my best to simplify it for your better understanding. All the magic starts on the handle file function. It takes three arguments. The AES key, which is the secret key we previously talked about. Note that it will be fetched from the server side. The input file, which will at the end be fully encrypted. And the boolean, allowing us to reuse this function for encryption and decryption. This will make the code so much more simple, you'll see. Set the function, we open both files in the most generic way possible and do proper error handling. 
Despite the blocks seeming intimidating, they're extremely simple for WinAPI developers and usually get copy-pasted around if no specific requirements are in place. First off, we'll have to acquire a new cryptography context. That's pretty much required in most WinCrypt functions, so we will most necessarily need it. Then we start encrypting the file gradually, in chunks of 320 bytes, which we encrypt with create encrypt, and then directly write to the file with guess what, write file. We keep track of the file size to know at which chunk we are at. Finally, we close all of our handles, destroy the private key and delete the initial file. That function will be used extensively since it's the backbone of the sample. You might be asking, how do you even encrypt directories? Oh well, let's examine the handle directory function. Here, ignoring all of the multi-threading stuff, it's very simple. We traverse through the directory using find first file and later on find the next file in a loop until we reach the end. Now, what about subdirectories? It's extremely simple. Every entry parsed by find next file doesn't necessarily have to be a file. To put it simply, directories are considered files too. And we can check if an entry is not a directory, and if it is, we just launch the exact same function encrypting that directory. That creates an infinite loop that encrypts all files and subdirectories in a very simple and predictable way. You might be asking yourself, if you encrypt a Windows folder, wouldn't the OS not even work? And you would be right. We already discussed previously about personal file separation methods and landed on the most simple one that would work for our case. Simply blacklisting known system directories. Our blacklist contains the Windows, program files and program data directories respectively. If they're detected, the whole operation is cancelled softly with the no error. Now that we have a working function that decrypts a directory, we want to encrypt the whole system, right? Theoretically, C, the default drive letter, should have all user files, right? Well, wrong. A lot of users just store their stuff on separate or even network drives. This is why we have a handle installation function. Moving to a global level now, we list all drive letters and determine the ones that are actually used to mount stuff. The drive letter itself is theoretically and practically considered the root directory. So we just pass it to the handle directory function. There's not much else to encryption, right? Actually, before all of that, we should have gotten the private key from the server. Well, this is where stuff overcomplicates itself and they don't really want to confuse you all with it. We basically just need to do a simple post request to our web server. But because WinAPI is so versatile and, to be honest, old, it makes it stupidly complex. This is exactly where I would suggest using a third-party library like curl, but I made it in WinAPI anyways, so we're going to skip this. The final payloads are just creating files in the desktop with any text you want and changing the wallpaper to pitch black. They're not really essential, but hey, it's something. The decryption that, that happens upon executing the file for a second time is just a window asking for the decryption key which then calls the handle installation function, this time on decryption mode. The server is possibly the easiest thing out of this project. It consists of a web server that upon sending a request to slash victim, logs the user with their IP and the 32 character private key into a database of some sort. Afterwards, it sends the random 32 character identifier back. We could have used hardware IDs or some other identifier, but again, this sample is just for testing and there's no real world usage for this. If anyone is interested in testing this out responsibly on their own environment, you will sadly have to do the following. First off, you will have to write a web server that can respond to a post request exactly the way shown on the screen right now. I purposefully didn't provide the server with the source code so people don't destroy their computers or launch a ransomware attack with the testing source code I gave out. Then you can just connect it with the source code inside of the get encryption key.c++ file. These steps are just precautions. Anyone can just browse code and experienced people may still abuse it, but I at the very least tried. And that's pretty much it. If you like this new series where we analyze malware and their payloads in great detail and then recreate them, 
consider dropping a like or a dislike respectively. Without the feedback, I don't know who wants me to continue and who doesn't. Thanks for watching everyone and stay safe.